tonight on 2020. Where is Trump? Explosive new discoveries in one of the country's most high-profile missing persons cases. A major development in one of the biggest murder cases of the last two decades. Chandra Levy, the D.C. intern, found dead in a park. And this is where she either fell down, was pushed down, or rolled down. How you doing? The congressman, Gary Condit, under suspicion. How come she calls your office so often? But now, 15 years later, playing out like the plot of a crime drama. 2020 with the crime scene video never before seen publicly. Voicemails never heard. Things are looking pretty good for me today anyway. And a bombshell twist from a mysterious whistleblower. Aren't you terrified hearing somebody describe how they killed people? Here's Deborah Roberts. It's not Ford's Theater or the Watergate Hotel. But this simple storage unit may soon claim its own place in the criminal history of Washington, D.C. So this is the place. Where did you put the recorder? I had the recorder right here behind that plastic bin. It was right here that this woman, speaking on camera for the first time, set up a bizarre amateur sting operation, which would upend one of DC's most famous murder cases, and she says endanger her own life. I honestly thought he's going to kill me. We're talking about the notorious Chandra Levy case. This case had everything. It had power, it had sex, it had the nation's capital, it had a young woman on the rise. And now, because of this woman, the man once convicted of the murder will walk free. Do you regret making those recordings? I had that recorder because my gut instinct told me something was really wrong and something terribly could happen. Tonight, for the first time, you'll hear her story. Hear from that suspected killer himself. We're on our way to meet the man many are convinced attacked and killed Chandra Levy. And something else you've never heard. Sorry, I haven't heard from you. Actual voicemail recordings from the congressman at the center of Chandra's story. It's 11.45. Uh, sorry, I've been tied up the last few days. So you already know that. In fact, we'll begin right there with what Condit left on 24-year-old Levy's home answering machine on a night in early May 2001. Maybe you're out of the out of the country or something. Anyway, give me a call. Pick up this message. The Democrat of Central California is wondering where Chandra is, and he's not the only one. I called up and called up, and then she didn't answer. Bob Levy, an oncologist, and wife Susan are expecting their 24-year-old daughter back home in Modesto, California. She was shy. She really liked being at home. Yet her daughter was ambitious, dreaming of a career in law enforcement. You sound like you're very content with the program and everything. Oh, yeah. She'd even volunteered at her local police department before heading to the nation's capital. She got the internship at the Department of Prisons there, and I think she was interested in going to the FBI. The FBI would be in Chandra's future, but not in the way she imagined. After nine months in D.C., the internship is over. Chandra cancels her gym membership and emails her landlord that she's heading back to California. Then I called again, then on the weekend, she didn't answer. Five days pass with no word. Chandra's anxious parents call police, who head to her apartment and make some noteworthy discoveries. It appeared to the police she was packed up, re ready to go home. FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett, now an ABC News consultant, worked the Levy case for years. Her driver's license, her credit cards. Her cell phone? And her cell phone were still in the apartment. That's baffling to me and others because the whole idea is when you're going to leave, you're at least going to take an ID. There were only two things missing, her keys and a ring. A gold ring with her initials CL in diamonds, a college graduation gift from her parents. What are you hearing from the police? Well, they were sort of nonchalant because what can they do? Police do canvass the area, including nearby Rock Creek Park. And Susan Levy begins her own search, looking through her daughter's cell phone bill. I saw this number that was being called many, many, many times. I decided to call that number, and it turned out to be Gary Connors, and he answered the phone. And what did you and, say? And I, I was kind of surprised, and I said, do you know where my daughter is? And I thought to myself, this is wrong. 
Come on in and, and make yourself home in my office, and I'll be back. Give me 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. I'll be right back. But why exactly was the congressman, a minister's son and married father of two, calling a young intern to get together? Give me a call. Give me uh, a rundown on kind of what your schedule is. Things are looking pretty good for me today. Anyway, bye. Condit's always maintained he cooperated with police and voluntarily came in for questioning. But former D.C. Chief of Detectives Jack Barrett believes Condit was being coy. He admitted to the detectives that first night that they were dating. We didn't know whether it was a, a friendly relationship. We didn't know if it was a sexual relationship. He didn't admit that he had a sexual relationship he with her. He did not. Word soon leaks that Condit and Levy did have something going on. She'd even dropped hints to her family. Listen to this home video. Terrence holds a lot of ventures in D.C., the Bureau of Prisons, and a congressman's friend. And Chandra had vaguely described a romance to her co-worker, Sven Jones. When she spoke of her relationship, um, she never offered a name. She just said, powerful person. Someone who she was in love with someone who she could see making a life with. Talk of a congressional sex scandal sets off a media firestorm. Police have questioned Congressman Gary Condit, who has reportedly said Levy spent some time in his Washington, D.C. area condo. In front of Gary Condit's office, the whole street was blocked off with TV trucks every day out in front of the Levy's house. The same thing, TV trucks, camera crews. Were you wondering or worrying for a second whether your father was somehow implicated in this? No, I knew he wasn't. I knew he had done nothing wrong, illegally wrong. When folks start calling my dad a murderer, it's wrong. Chad is Condit's eldest child, a top aide to the governor of California when the Levy case broke. He hadn't hurt her, hadn't obstructed justice, told the law enforcement people from the start what the deal was. The Levies aren't buying it and take their suspicions public. We would ask Congressman Condit and anybody else with information to please come forward. Please cooperate with the police. From the very beginning, he was trying to protect his professional reputation as a congressman. Excuse me. He was the one that created this problem for himself. We had no place to turn other than to try and focus on him. Congressman, now why won't you take a polygraph? It becomes the summer of Condit. American TVs saturated with daily images of the gaunt congressman, grinning through clenched teeth as he tries to maintain a facade of normalcy. Wish I would have gave him better advice. I mean, I wish somebody would have. You have a relationship of friendship that is hard to explain. Yet his dad will have some more explaining to do. Did you urge Anne Marie Smith to lie? People come forward alleging Condit had relationships with other women. He declines to discuss those allegations. And we identified a number of women that were dating him while he was here in D.C. and his family was back in California. The floodgates are open. Protests call for Condit's resignation. Up next, while police aren't turning up any breaks in the case, okay, folks, we are ready to go. Condit turns up on television for a historically awkward interview on ABC. Congressman Condit, do you know what happened to Chandra Levy? What a twisted tale already. I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. That question, what happened to Chandra Levy, was going to be front and center at an all-new trial taking place right now. But that trial was scuttled because of the stunning new information you're about to hear. An explosive new seven-hour recording that has turned a case that was solved into a mystery all over again. So join us right here tonight as we take you into Rock Creek Park, video never seen before, right from the crime scene. How you doing? It's the summer of 2001, and Gary Condit's role in the Chandra Levy case is blocking out the sun. So the pressure is mounting on Congressman Condit. The parents turn up the heat on Gary Condit. The story was a congressman with an intern. It wasn't the story about this poor girl being missing and all these families being destroyed over this. Posters of the young intern are plastered from the Potomac to Capitol Hill. Her parents determined to keep their missing daughter in the public eye. Where is Chandra? make the rounds on television. 
We just want her back. But it's not easy to maintain a brave face. Help us. Help us, her. That's Dr. Levy breaking down on ABC Sacramento affiliate KXTV. <laughs> Police continue grilling the congressman, trying to tamp down the speculation. The congressman was not a suspect before the meeting, he was not a suspect during the meeting, and he is not a suspect since the meeting. Yet the Levies are convinced that Condit not only committed adultery, but perhaps something much worse. I urge him if he does have any information, please be man enough to step forward. Hoping to change the narrative, Condit agrees to a national television interview with ABC's Connie Chung. He felt as if I was interrogating him under a hot light. In many ways, I was. 24 million people watched the interview. It went a lot like this. Congressman Condit, do you know what happened to Chandra Levy? No, I do not. Did you have anything to do with her disappearance? No, I didn't. Did you kill Chandra Levy? I did not. We had a close relationship. I liked her very much. May I ask you, was it a sexual relationship? Well, Connie, I've been married for 34 years, and uh, I've not been a, a perfect man, and I've made my share of mistakes. But um, out of respect for my family and out of a specific request from the Levy family, uh, I think it's best that I not get into those details uh, about Chandra Levy. Was that respect for you? I yeah. laughed about it because I thought it was so false. Phony. It's just his way of weaseling out of it. It was preposterous. You just have to shake your head and say, why would he even agree to do the interview if he's not going to be forthcoming? All new Dr. Phil. Just last week, Condit gave his first interview in 14 years to Dr. Phil. She came out your condo once. Well, maybe twice. He may have looked somewhat different, but he sounded pretty much the same. Why is it you will not answer publicly whether or not you had a sexual relationship with Chandra Levy? I haven't, you know, answer that question publicly for for 15 years and I'm not going to change my uh, my position or my view on that today. But if Condit is reluctant to speak frankly, the forensic evidence speaks for itself. Chandra Levy's panties, taken from her apartment shortly after her disappearance, contained bodily fluids. DNA tests determined the fluids came from Gary Condit. And yet, think what you will of Gary Condit, there's no evidence he was involved in Chandra Levy's disappearance. Most of us in the police department and the FBI agreed that he was not our suspect and that we need to be looking elsewhere. The case of the missing Washington intern. As the case continues to dominate the news, it seems nothing can trump the story of the missing intern and her friendly congressman. Until, of course, something does. And then September 11 happens. What happened to you and your investigation and your detectives? The media attention went away. We lost a big helping hand with the FBI because the devotion of resources to terrorism, things changed dramatically. With the world's attention diverted, the Levies are left with little to go on. Because there's no body, you still hope she's alive somewhere like with any missing person. That's all you got is hope. As the case loses momentum, Gary Condit lost his congressional seat. Condit loses his bid for re-election to nobody's surprise. Very difficult to win a race when you're being accused of murder. It's been a great opportunity to be in public service. Weeks later, a striking coincidence. Award-winning Washington Post reporter Sari Horowitz is revisiting the now cold case of the missing intern. I arranged a breakfast with a police official, and during the breakfast, his pager just started going off. Then, a timely break that a reporter can only dream of. And when he came back, he had this stunned look on his face. And he said, you're not going to believe this, but I just got a call, and they think they found Chandra Levy's remains in Rock Creek Park. The remains lay in a remote section of Washington's largest park, five miles from Chandra's apartment. Finally, they discover her body in Rock Creek Park. Wow. Huge park. Huge park. Twice as big as Central Park in New York City. The gruesome discovery made by a park regular. He was parked out. I was walking my dog, and I came across a human skull. This is actual crime scene video, never before seen publicly. Those are Chandra's Reebok sneakers and her jogging pants tied in knots, which will lead investigators to believe this was no accident.
but no sighting of her gold ring. We cried. Yeah, I cried we a lot. Screamed and cried. Yeah. You can't imagine to have your child laying out there. It seems so unfair. For detectives, the discovery brings relief, but also embarrassment. This is something that uh, we all have to live with. There may have been DNA evidence that all that was lost because of the fact that we were unable to locate her remains during the time that we were searching the park. The remains found 79 yards off a dirt path down a sharply steep embankment. Police had searched 100 yards off all paved roads. Had they searched 100 yards off all foot trails too, they may have found Chandra's body, DNA intact, months earlier. Some people see that as evidence of ineptitude on the part of the police. Is that fair? Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Critics say it wasn't to be the only police blunder. Days after Levy's disappearance, an untrained officer tried going through her computer and accidentally corrupted the data, which would have shown Levy had researched Rock Creek Park. And on top of that, another oversight at her apartment building. What about the surveillance camera of her building? So many times people look to see who came and went in a building. Things like surveillance cameras, unless you go and initially grab them or tell the management to hold them, they erase or disappear. And unfortunately, that's what happened in this case. At least now the Levies can have a memorial and lay their beloved daughter to rest. She was a quiet but very powerful force, very smart and funny. I felt like she was going somewhere. It was just really disheartening. When we come back, police find more secrets in the park and set sights on a new man. Will there be justice for Chandra? When we get two attacks on women by a guy with a knife, in a short distance to where Levy's body was found, that stands out like a neon sign. And for the first time, the voice of the witness who could both make and break the case. He told me he didn't know he killed her. It was an accident. Twenty Twenty continues with mystery in Rock Creek Park. Sprawling Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C. With its 2,000 acres of lush trees, quiet streams, and wildlife, a perfect place for a walk or a crime. Look at how remote this is. It's quiet. There aren't any other witnesses. So this is an ideal spot for a predator to attack somebody. Yeah, this is right off the beaten path. Dr. Kim Rosmo maps murderers. This is the apartment building near DuPont Circle where Chandra Levy lived. This is where Chandra Levy's remains were found. His title, geographic profiler. His job, analyzing every location in a crime. I think she followed up the path here, and then she was attacked and her body was found here. Decoding the patterns that can crack a case. We break a crime down to its constituent parts. So for a murder, we're going to have an encounter, the place where the offender first sees the victim. Then we're going to have the point where he first attacks her. Then we have the actual murder scene itself. Then finally, we have where the body gets disposed of. Rosmo was brought into the Chandra Levy case by the DC Metro Police and the FBI after focus shifted away from Congressman Gary Condit. We made it pretty clear to the prosecutors that we didn't think that Condit had anything to do with it. Instead, police gradually retrained their focus on this man, who'd been arrested for attacking two female joggers in the park just two months after Chandra's disappearance. Not enough attention was being paid to a suspect who was hiding in plain sight. Both attacks occurred in similar park locations. Same sort of path, same sort of a slope boost is probably even steeper, uh, same sort of isolation. Both women fought off their assailant and survived. The first female jogger, um, the one who was attacked about 700 yards from where Levy's body was found, said she saw Guandique in the Pierce Mill parking lot. And if you look at where uh, Chandra Levy lived, the logical route would have taken her right through the Pierce Mill parking lot. So who's the predator in the park? His name, Ingmar Guandique, a 19-year-old undocumented construction worker from El Salvador. He had alcohol problems, he had cocaine problems. Sari Horowitz and her Washington Post colleague Scott Hyam published an explosive series of articles questioning why the Metro PD hadn't pursued Guandique harder in the Levy case, given his disturbing M.O. 
he would sit at a park bench and he saw a certain type of female that something inside of him would compel him to give chase. He would sprint up behind them, grab them around the neck, and pull them off the trail. I'd seen an article in the Washington Post that talked about this guy called Gwen DK who attacked two women in the park. The microgeography was identical. So I was curious, how, how had they dismissed him? Why would somebody who attacked a woman and possibly even killed her come back to the same area and attack two more women right after that? Because it worked for him. One DK's hit with a 10-year sentence for the attacks. But now, after those scathing Washington Post articles, police look at the Levy case with fresh eyes, zeroing in on Juan DK's activity around the time Chandra vanished. We know he didn't go to work on May the 1st. We know that he had marks on his face um, following the disappearance of Levy that he gave inconsistent explanations for. But you can only solve a crime through a confession, physical evidence, or a witness. But there's nothing to actually tie him to Chandra Levy. Unfortunately, uh, one of the best means of finding physical evidence from the body had been lost because of its decomposition. But all is not lost. Coming up, police find something. Make that someone who they say will finally connect Wandike to Chandra Levy. The arrestee is Ingmar Wandike. And still to come, what role does this woman, an extra from House of Cards, and her secret seven-hour recording have to do with the case? I feel like I'm in the House of Cards. It's been nearly a decade since Chandra Levy's disappearance, and now prosecutors finally bring murder charges against Ingmar Gwandike and take him to trial. The Chandra Levy trial is set to begin today. A case that once riveted the nation. What was it like for you being at that trial? It wasn't easy. Cameras aren't allowed in the courtroom, but the emotional testimony from two female joggers who survived Gwandike's attacks take the gallery's breath away. It's almost like Chandra is testifying through these women on the witness stand. Gary Condit has been diligently avoiding the spotlight, but now finds himself right back in the middle of it. Mr. Condit, anything you want to say? Called to testify, he heads to court with a media circus in tow. I think he was kind of the elephant in the room, and they needed to uh, demystify him. Former U.S. Attorney Tim Hapey prosecuted cases in the D.C. office. It would have been too easy if he were a silent presence for the defense to suggest directly or subtly that he was the real culprit. A condit sighting always makes headlines, but now prosecutors are hanging their case on a secret weapon. Today, one of the prosecution's star witnesses. Meet Armando Morales, a California gangster with a record and tattoo to prove it. That paw print marks him as a member of the Fresno Bulldogs, a gang notorious enough to merit a documentary on the History Channel. Here's Morales' cameo. A bulldog named Armando Mousy Morales. Back in 2006, Morales and Guandique were sharing a federal prison cell for separate crimes. Now, on the stand, Morales makes a stunning allegation. Guandique made a detailed confession to the Levy murder. Juror Cherie Bacon. His testimony was convincing. He knew certain things. After Morales' testimony, Guandique is found guilty and sentenced to 60 years in prison. A jury convicted Ingmar Guandique on two counts of first-degree murder. The results of the verdict may be guilty, but I have a lifetime sentence of a lost limb missing from our family tree. One of the country's longest ongoing murder mysteries is finally over. Or is it? The conviction starts to wobble two years later when the defense discovers that the snitch Morales concealed a crucial fact from the jury. He'd had a history of working with law enforcement. Knowing those prosecutors, uh, my guess is they had no idea until after the fact about Mr. Morales's prior cooperation. Maybe they should have. Honest mistake or not, it's a big enough deal to make some very big news. The accused killer is getting a new trial. What happened for you when you heard that Wandiki was going to get a new trial. There was a part of me said, well, maybe Mr. Condit's going to be asked to come back and talk a little bit more in depth. 
Susan's instincts are spot on. A major development in one of the biggest murder cases of the last two decades. The defense is pointing the finger at California congressman. When DK's attorneys allude to a defense straight from Fifty Shades of Grey. They wanted to develop information about other relationships he had uh, that may have involved rough sex play. It looks like Condit's sex life could be on trial, but wait. <laughs> Out of nowhere, this woman is about to crash into the case. Things will never be the same. A 15-year-old murder case is turned on its head because of you. Did you ever expect that? No, absolutely not. She's reluctant to talk to us, saying she's in danger and keeps her whereabouts secret. You don't want us to say where you are? Um, I feel unsafe. Her name? Babs Proler, a small-time actress originally from Germany. An extra, coincidentally, in the smash political drama, House of Cards. We overcame those tensions. So how exactly did she land a role in a famous D.C. murder case? I mean, sometimes real life, I think, can be... Stranger than stranger fiction. Stranger than fiction, absolutely. Her strange tale begins this past July in Annapolis, Maryland. Babs is going through rough times and staying for a while at this country inn and suites. During her stay, she crosses paths with a mysterious middle-aged man who calls himself Phoenix. He was very kind. He was very friendly. He seemed like a very personal, nice guy. Was there no. a spark going no, on here? No, no, there was no spark. But they grow closer and a friendship ensues. Phoenix even babysits Bab's golden retriever, Buddy, while she's out of town. That's him with Buddy, and Buddy actually has a paw up there on him. But don't let those sweet selfies fool you. Phoenix has a paw of his own, that tattoo marking him as a former gangster from the Fresno Bulldogs. He is, in fact, the same snitch who testified so convincingly at the Chandra Levy trial, Armando Morales. His face changed completely. It went from this gentle, kind, caring guy into a look that almost scared me a little. Trusting his new friend, Morales reveals he's just done 20 years in prison. I said, 20 years? You must have almost killed someone to be in for 20 years. And his answer was, I wish it would have only been one person. So what's he doing here? Morales explains he's the key witness in the upcoming retrial of Ingmar Guandique. While preparing to testify, the government has put him up in the hotel with a cell phone, a room key, and some cash, and strict orders not to blow his cover. What did you think? I was intrigued of his involvement, what he knew. She's intrigued enough to continue the odd friendship, but also scared that the criminal could hurt her or those close to her. So she makes a fateful decision. Bab says that for her own protection, she begins recording her conversations with Morales in the hotel, in the car, even in this storage locker where he's helping her organize her things. This is where you recorded it all, mostly. I did. Next, those secret recordings that will rock the Levy case and get a convicted killer out of prison. Let's go in there. He told me he didn't know he killed her. What started as a circus ended as a circus. A row of storage units near Annapolis, Maryland. Isolated, a little spooky. Maybe not the first place you'd pick to secretly record a career criminal. But then again, you're not Babs Proler. So this is the storage facility, and this is the unit that I work with. Armando. And you had your recorder on you when you were in here? I did. I put it actually right here on the shelf. Do you see yourself as here? some kind of an investigator? Is that what you're out to do? Are you out to get the attention? No, I didn't want to have my name really involved. It wasn't supposed to be exposed at all. I only started taping because I totally was afraid. 2020 has obtained seven hours of conversations between Babs and her new friend Armando Morales. I got 22 year sentence for gang racketeering the prison snitch so crucial to the Chandra Levy investigation. I feel like I'm back on TV, like an episode Real. of House of Cards, you know? Funny. The tape seems to reveal that the ex-con Armando Morales hasn't forgotten his gangster past. I brought a hoodie, I brought dark clothes. Oh my God. 
I was ready to confront that He's not going to get away with that. And listen to how he brags about cooperating with law enforcement to put Ingmar Gwandiki away for the Levy murder. I'm under the protection of the U.S. government. I think he was trying to impress an attractive woman. He had been in prison for 20 years. He's about to testify in one of the biggest trials in the United States. And to be talking to a stranger, it was a rookie move for a lifelong criminal. When conversation turns to the Levy case, Morales tells Babs what he told the court, that Guandique told him the crime was a robbery gone wrong. It was an accident. He didn't know he killed her. He went back. That was his, his area to steal and, and rob. Curious Bab starts probing, telling Morales she's not convinced the right guy is behind bars. Wait a minute. The dude that I testified, mm -hmm. he committed the homicide. Are you sure? Why wouldn't I be sure? People talk. They just brag about stuff to make sure that they look good. I don't know. I can't answer that. Anytime I ask a really detailed question, he would go into, don't go there. He's got other victims. That he killed? Don't go there. There was only skeletons. Don't go there. He said Child. he didn't mean to kill her. He robbed her and... Well, no. He's in the cell with me. Do you think he's going to tell me I meant to do that? Come on. Hello. She says all those evasions make the whole account seem fishy. To me, it didn't make sense. I ended up feeling like you made this up. Why would he lie? Why? What was in it for him? He said, uh, I wanted protective custody. I no longer wanted to be afraid because I was always afraid. Which is exactly what one DK's defense attorneys argued in a 114-page filing. Morales had a powerful motive to fabricate testimony, a desire for safety from enemies who want him dead. Plus, Proler says, Morales may have hoped the feds might help him dodge a murder rap of his own back in California. He said in, in Fresno he was involved in a gang-related um, murder that they're trying to pin on him, but that's being handled. Aren't you terrified hearing somebody describe how they killed people? Absolutely. Uh, I'm scared out of my mind. Morales might be protected by the government and Proler might be in danger. But for whatever reason, she keeps pressing record and keeps pressing Morales. Finally, she claims her persistence pays off. Morales cracks, admitting he fabricated Guandique's confession. And then he says, you know what? The prosecutors wanted me to lie. They knew they had the right guy. They just needed somebody to say it. He said that to you? Yes. And you had that on a recording? Mm -hmm. Of course, we wanted to hear that part of the recording. But get this, after repeatedly assuring us it exists, Proler has not produced it. Prosecutors have categorically denied what they call baseless allegations. Some people would say you have credibility issues. Make that legal issues, too. We've discovered Proler has a checkered past. The suggestion is that you've had aliases, that you've had sort of a sketchy past yourself. No, no. I was married twice and I had my name officially changed after the divorce. There's also an accusation of theft. What about the theft? Were you charged? I was charged. Enough to earn her three years probation. Some would say you're a scam artist. True? I've never taken anything from anybody. I have not taken money. What am I trying to scam out of this? Okay, maybe it was just a passion for justice that then drives Perler to reach out to Chandra Levy's mom, Susan. What did she say? Morales lied about Gwendiki's confession. And what are you making of this? And I thought, oh my God, this is so weird. Why don't you send a tape for both the prosecutor and oh. the defense team? You send it to them. The prosecutors met with me first. They couldn't have liked this. No, no. But if prosecutors listened to the same recordings we did, they didn't hear Morales confessing. They heard him sticking to his original story. He told me he didn't know he killed her. It was an accident. He didn't recant his testimony. In fact, he doubled down on his testimony. Morales' attorney tells 2020 he never told Babs he made up the confession. Despite all that, this past July, the bombshell detonates. There is a stunning turn tonight. Prosecutors suddenly dropping murder charges. The U.S. Attorney's Office drops the case, releasing a tersely worded statement. The office has concluded it can no longer prove the murder case against Mr. Guandique beyond a reasonable doubt. The multi-million dollar question, why would they drop the Chandra Levy case? Clearly something occurred 
which probably eliminated Morales as a witness. On those tapes, he brags a lot about his thug life and his life as a criminal. So oh, they send some people to shoot up all the car dealers' businesses. It's a defense attorney's dream come true. It would be a subject of cross-examination, and the calculus could have been, there's just too much baggage for this witness, too many things that he has said and done. Whatever Prohler's true intentions, the Chandra Levy case is now in shambles. It fell apart because of this, this woman tampered with the, with the witness. Why did she do that? What was her motive? Because I felt guilty. I felt really bad about what happened. Why? Oh, I thought, well, maybe I should not have called this number. The Levies now have the rest of their lives to ponder the what ifs. And Prohler says she's worried Morales will come after her for revenge. His current whereabouts, unknown. My life has been affected negatively. I'm moving from hotel to hotel right now. I'm afraid. Why don't you decide to talk with us? I believe that the truth needs to come out. I think somebody out there knows something. I've tried to be brave through all of that. Still to come, we've heard from everyone else. Now, hear from the man once convicted of killing Chandra Levy himself. We're on our way to meet Ingmar Guandique. Just weeks ago, during a visit to Rock Creek Park, where Chandra Levy's remains were discovered, Hello? 2020 producers got an unusual phone call. Un residente in Farmville Detention Center. Sí, hola, Ingmar. The undocumented immigrant, recently freed from a 60-year sentence for the murder of Chandra Levy, sits in an immigration detention facility, awaiting deportation, and now has agreed to speak only with 2020. Hello, Ingmar? Hey. Immigration and Customs Enforcement has a strict no-camera policy in their facility, so we give Guandique a call. Have you ever harmed a woman? Have you ever shoved or hit a woman? <clears throat> this could be your last chance to set the record straight. Did you attack Chandra Levy? Did you confess to Morales? He sounds a bit rehearsed, so we decide to fly down to the highly secured detention facility in Farmville, Virginia to look Guandique in the eye. We're about to sit down with Gwen DK. I'm going to show him a picture of Levy and ask him face to face if he killed her. Inside, he continues to maintain his innocence, saying he's found salvation for his previous crimes. Gwen DK seemed anxious to talk to us. He was filled with lots of details about why he's innocent. And of course, he denied that he ever touched or killed Chandra Levy. 15 years after Chandra Levy first went missing, here's where things stand today. The prime suspect, Ingmar Guandique, wants to stay permanently in the U.S. It's unlikely that will happen. He's clearly uh, got aggravated felonies, which is grounds for deportation. Disgraced Congressman Gary Condit is out of politics and for the most part out of the public eye. But there he 